It was September 10, 1940, the height of World War II. 300 German planes just raided London three days before, leaving piles of burning rubber. Life was rough in these wartime conditions. Yet, believe it or not, university entrance examinations still went on. On the morning of September 10, a group of anxious students hurriedly took a look at their question papers as the clock struck 10. And today, after more than 80 years later, we are going to follow in their footsteps and recreate the experience of sitting the University of London matriculation paper, Elementary Mathematics 1, Arithmetic and Algebra. It'll be fun to see how much the curriculum has changed and whether the math syllabus back then was more difficult than what kids study today. Obviously, calculators were still not a thing in 1940, so the usage will not be allowed. Also, we are given 3 hours to solve 9 questions out of the total 10 given. We are provided with a logarithm table, God knows what is that, and off we go with the paper. The first question has to do with calculating the compound interest, which, to be honest, is pretty easy. We just need to multiply the initial principle with 1.045 cubed, and then subtract off the initial principle to find the total compound interest. Without a calculator, I imagine all the calculations would take slightly longer. So, while we bask in the glory of technological advance, being able to calculate complex expressions in a second using a scientific calculator, let's spare a thought for our forefathers of the past who have had to put up with all this tedious work. No wonder kids hate math. It must be hereditary and came from the parents. The second question deals with ratio and proportion. And given the climate of war during which the paper is written, the question itself seems hauntingly real, as if such a scenario could have actually taken place. So, we have a garrison of 1,075 men, and they could survive on full ration for 30 days. They spent 16 days on full ration, after which 129 men came in for reinforcement, and the existing ration got increased by 60% at the same time. Now the situation on the battlefield might have turned sour, and we are required to calculate the days the rations could last if all the men were to subsist on half rations instead from now on. To do this, let's assume that we start off with one full unit of ration. We know that one thirtieth of the ration would be depleted each day if we are feeding 1,075 men. After 16 days on full ration, only 715 units of ration was left, but the 60% replenishment leaves us at 56 over 75 units. With a larger hit count of 1,204, assuming full rations each day, the ration would deplete at a rate of more than 1 over 30th, multiplied by 1,204 over 1,075. Now, taking into assumption that the troops were to subsist on half rations, we halve the rate of depletion to get 602 over 1,075 multiplied by 130 units of ration depleted per day. And finally, we divide 56 over 75 by this number to see that the rations would last 40 days exactly. Question 3 deals with algebra, which we can dispatch off easily as follows. Part 1a. Factoring the expression gives us 6x minus 5 multiplied with 2x plus 1. For part 1b, the best we can do would be this. We factorize the x bits and y bits separately, and I think this is the furthest we can go. For part 2 of the question, we would need to factorize the denominators first like this. We can see that the common denominator would be x minus 2, x plus 2, and x plus 1. So we can multiply each denominator with, with the factor which is missing and combine them into a single fraction. We move on to question 4, and it looks like there are two equations to solve here. For the first one, to get rid of a denominator, we can multiply throughout by the factors x minus 3 multiplied by 2x plus 1, provided that x is neither 3 nor minus half, after which we seem to get the quadratic equation. However, Clearing out terms, we see that the equation is actually linear, and solving it gives x equals 3 over 8. We would have to substitute this answer back into our original equation to ensure that the solution is indeed valid. The second part of the question concerns solving simultaneous equations. We can rearrange the first equation so that y equals 2x plus 4, and substituting this y into the second equation gives a quadratic equation, which we can factorize nicely. And this gives us two sets of solutions for x and y, the first set is x equals minus 13 over 4, y equals minus 5 over 2, while the second set is x equals minus 3 over 2, and y equals 1. In the first part of question 5, we need to express p as a subject. The first step will be to cube both sides to get rid of the cube root. We then bring x over p to one side before taking the reciprocal. 
Doing so allows us to flip P up from a denominator position. And after some rearranging, we see that P equals x power 4 divided by x cubed minus y cubed. I had no idea how to use a logarithm table before I did this question. I guess the logarithm table would be fairly common to students in 1940. But the modern generation, me included, has been spoiled rotten as we can use a calculator to find any square roots or cube roots easily. To stay true to the spirit of 1940, and for the benefit of my audience who do not know how to use a logarithm table before this, I will be finding the cube root of 0 0.0775052 using a logarithm table. The technique goes as follows. We first let x or y, in this case, be our desired answer, take base 10 on both sides to get log 10 y equals 1 third log 10 0 0.0775052. If you look at the logarithm table, they are designed for numbers from 10 to 100 not a number like 0 0.077. We can, however, add 1 to both sides of the equation and use the rules of logarithm to combine the logs on the right-hand side to get 1 third log 77.5052 on the right-hand side. Having done this, we can search for 77 on the first column of the log table and 5 on the row header. This point to the number 8893. The next figure in our number is 1, rounded up from 0 0.52. So we look for the column with 1 in the mean difference columns and add this number to the existing 8893 we have gotten earlier to obtain 8894. Now, this is the mantissa or the decimal part of our logarithm. To obtain the integer part or what people in 1940 call characteristic, we just have to observe that since 77 lies strictly between 10 and 100, me must have 1 for the integer part. Having done all of the above, we see that log 10y equals 1.8894 divided by 3 minus 1, which is 0 0.3702. The logarithm table can also be used to find the anti-log, but minus 0 0.3702 is not in the range, so we have to add 2 to both sides of the equation to get log 10 100y equals 1.6298. We can now look for 6298 in the table, but 6294 is the closest we can get to which correspond to row 42 and column 6. To get to 6298, we will have to add a mean difference of 4, and that correspond to column 4. So we see that 100y equals 42.64. Dividing by 100 gives 0 0.4264, and that is the cube root we seek. Question 6 is graph sketching on a piece of paper, no less. We all know how to do this, so instead of taking a long approach, I will just show you a piece of work taken from Bufam Alpha. Before any of you start objecting, do note that exam only requires us to answer 9 of the 10 questions. And unlike finding the cube root using a logarithm table, you probably won't learn anything new by watching me sketching a simple graph on a piece of paper. Anyway, when y is 2, by solving the quadratic equation, x should be 1 plus square root of 21. And it is self-explanatory to see that this is indeed a solution to the equation given when y is 2. I know this is cheating, but I'd rather do this than wasting time sketching a graph. Question 7 is rather interesting. First thing first, we can draw the right angle triangle, label the sides A and B, and the hypotenuse as A plus B minus 8. Since the hypotenuse is 8 inches shorter than the sum of the other two side lengths, since the area is 120 square inches, we see that half AB equals 120, which implies A times B equals 240. Now, we can form another equation using Pythagoras theorem, which says that a square plus b square equals a plus b minus 8 square. Simplifying this, we get 8a plus 8b minus ab minus 32 equals 0. Upon substituting ab equals 240 and simplifying, we get a plus b equals 34. And so, now we can solve the equation simultaneously with ab equals 240. We get the quadratic equation b square minus 34b plus 240 equals 0, which we factorize as b minus 24 multiplied by b minus 10 equals 0. So b is either 24 or 10, and the corresponding a is 10 or 24. So we see that there's actually a degree of symmetry here, and it doesn't matter how we label the initial sides. There are two parts to question 8. For the first part, it deals with arithmetic progression, and we have to find the sum of the first 75 terms. Using the familiar formula for sum of terms in arithmetic progression, we set the difference d equals minus 0 0.2, the first term a equals 10.6 and n equals 75 to get 240 as a sum. 
To find the term of the sequence which will equal 0, we use tn equals a plus n minus 1 multiplied by d formula. Set tn equals 0, a equals 10.6, and d equals minus 0 0.2, and doing so, we see that n is 54, so the 54th term is 0. The second part of the question is complete bookwork, but the proof is quite nice. We denote s as the sum of first n terms of our geometric progression, and so we can write s equals a plus ar plus ar square and so on until we finish adding the last term, a r power n minus 1. Now right beneath the first row, we multiply the equation above throughout by r, which produces rs equals ar plus ar square plus dot 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 plus a power r power n. The correct part of the proof involves taking the difference between the two equations and eliminating a bunch of intermediate terms. Taking the second equation minus the first, we get r minus 1 s on the left hand side and on the right hand side we get a r power n minus a and after a little bit of rearranging we get the desired result of the question. Question 9 is a bit of mystery to me. While the problem itself is easy to solve using a calculator, I don't see a way this can be done at all if some sort of trigonometry table isn't given. The question paper does say that logarithm tables are provided. I have no idea whether a similar trigonometry table is printed on the overleaf of whatever paper logarithm tables are on, or students from 1940 are just so powerful that they can just find the inverse of sine or cosine of their head. Anyway, I will make an exception here and refer to the calculator to get an answer of 25.22 degrees for the angle measure. Next up is length of AC, but we can actually easily get that by applying Pythagoras theorem. The last part to the question again involves the use of trigonometry and so requires the use of a calculator or the more old-fashioned trigonometric tables for us to find the inverse. Having done that, we see that the angle they want is 62.1 degrees. And finally, our last question of the paper. So basically, there's a river, two poles are apart from one another and on the northern side, and we are given the bearing measure from a southern bank. Drawing a diagram definitely makes things a lot clearer. The final result we wanted to prove has a tangent in it, so we better write down expressions for tangent alpha and tangent beta. Since the final expression does not have x in it, we will have to eliminate that. We can do that by expressing x as a subject and then equating the right-hand sides of both equations, giving us the final results we wanted. Finally, using a calculator in substitution for the trigonometric table, we find the following y and op with the given d, alpha, and beta. It has been a fun ride overall. I think the paper was not too challenging for university entrance, but again, it might be that students nowadays study way more material and have access to calculators and whatnot during exams. Tell me what you think in the comments, and I will see you in the next video.